ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there are some occasions uh, in our political lives when it is good but to take uh, stock of the position, to see how far wrong we have been, or how far right we have been. See where we stand. Well, tonight, I want to claim that in the present situation, we have been proved so far right that this country can have some confidence uh, in our judgment of the future. I claim that at present, we are proved right in Europe, in Africa, and in the social policies which depended on our principles in those questions. And we have been right, not because we were guided by any peculiar vision or forethought, but because we have been guided throughout by perfectly clear principles from which we have never deviated and which you can trace and observe uh, throughout the life and career of our movement. We have been guided above all by the principle, by a belief in the underlying unity of Europe. We have believed in ourselves as Englishmen and Europeans, we have believed in our fellow Europeans, and we have believed in the destiny of Europe. And believing as we have for years past in those principles and holding those deep beliefs, we have been led inevitably through some hard ways and courses to our present position in which I shall claim we are at last triumphantly justified. That principle of the underlying unity of Europe guided us in the war. As ex-service men of the previous war, we did not believe in the division of Europe, in the massacre without good reason of yet another generation of young Europeans being thrown against each other to fight and destroy one another in unnecessary war. We were ready as ever to fight if the life of our own country was at stake, but the life of Britain was not at stake. And we opposed that war by all the political means open to us because we believed in the unity of Europe and we did not believe in the division of our continent and the destruction of its young life without vital reason. Uh, I have spoken before and I shall not repeat myself tonight. I've spoken of what took me into politics first, the concept of the young airmen with whom I served in the First World War the men who on each side knew each other and loved each other in friendly competition in the days of 1914, in the early days of European flying, and were then thrown in mortal combat against each other uh, by old men uh, who were far away from the scene of that combat and had divided Europe in a totally unnecessary quarrel. And I described how coming back uh, from that a holocaust of my generation, uh, I and others resolved these things should not occur again without good reason. And there could only be one good reason, that Britain's life was in mortal danger. And in 1939, no one can possibly contend that it was. Anyhow, that belongs now uh, to past history. We followed then the guiding star of European Union, the resolve that these European peoples should not be rent by fratricidal war, but should come together, come together in a great union, which should make them the greatest and most beneficent power on earth. And so, naturally and inevitably, after the war, we were led to the policy of European nation. And I declared it on your behalf, behalf of our movement way back in 1948. European nation, meant quite simply Europe with its own government, a government which would fulfill all major purposes. But it did not mean a universal mix-up, the loss of all our national characters, turning Frenchmen into Englishmen or Englishmen into Germans or Italians or anything else. Anybody who was mad enough to try to do that, of course, could not possibly succeed. You couldn't do it in hundreds of years, not, not in centuries, not in a millennium. 
And above all, we want to preserve national characters, to drive still deeper in the soil of our continent the individual roots. And as I so often claim, when you make the great tree of Europe reaching up with its branches towards the skies, the roots of the individual peoples, British, French, Germans, and the rest of it, drive still deeper into their native soil. And the only possible security we can have in the modern world of continental politics is to have a great union, a big community, within which we can preserve our national identities. But to do that, of course, we have to have union of Europe uh, with the European government, just as we had in an earlier stage, the present stage, to have the union of Great Britain instead of having separate governments in England, in Scotland, and in Wales. But that didn't turn me as an Englishman into a Scotsman, or some of you who are Scotsmen uh, into an Englishman. We do not lose our national character. We derive a greater security in the development of that character within a greater community. Well, we announced that policy uh, of Europe and nation. An absolutely clear-cut policy saying you never could organize our affairs until you cease to have this internecine struggle between the divided European peoples and made one great community instead of the small warring communities of today. Those policies were rejected, completely rejected. For a time they played the fool with negotiations about the common market, which for reasons which were clear to see were doomed to break down from the start, reasons we'll look at in a moment. And then these people who never believed in Europe once again returned where they began to a rejection of the whole great concept. With what results? With the results you can see in your everyday life and will see still more in the events which are coming, that one of these little nations or another is always underneath, one or more, another may be on top. But when the little countries of Europe are fighting each other on world markets, fighting desperately with export trade in order to sell abroad enough to buy the food and raw materials they cannot produce for themselves, the whole thing is just a wild dogfight. Brother against brother in a cutthroat competition in which one country or another must always succumb. Uh, at the moment, our country of Great Britain uh, has got a less inflation than the others, is doing a, a little better, hence the present boom. But what does success mean in this competition? The nation which succeeds is the country which has been most successful in holding down its wages and its standard of life. When you manage to keep down your standard of life and your wages, you keep down your costs. When you keep down your costs, you compete successfully in world markets. And the countries who have a go, who raise wages and expand production, have full production and the rest of it, they get a cost inflation, they fail to compete, they have a currency crash or a devaluation or a deflation or some other disaster, and then somebody else is in the difficulty. And again and again, you see first one nation down and another up, then the position reverse, and an eternal struggle and fight between these countries who should be in the community of a great brotherhood, organizing together uh, their economic affairs. And you will see more and more uh, in the coming days uh, that we shall run into grave economic troubles unless we can resolve these problems and the only possible way to do it uh, is by European government. Well, why even within uh, the common market, after the rejection of Britain for reasons we'll examine, even within the common market they are failing to organize their position. You've heard of the agricultural surpluses. There we were in the European negotiations solemnly negotiating, wasn't it, for nearly nine months, a position which was completely impossible uh, within the limits and range of their policy. They wanted 
to take the surplus of foodstuffs produced by the British dominions and add it to the surplus of foodstuffs produced by Europe already. Why, already within the common market there is trouble uh, because they've got a surplus of food production uh, and they cannot absorb it within the limits uh, of their small policies. And our only proposal in the major matter was to take our great surplus from the dominions, add it to their surplus and make confusion worth confounding. In other words, you cannot, within the limits of present policy, begin to resolve uh, any of these problems. Uh, you may say, well then how does your European nation policy uh, deal with a problem like that? Uh, and I can give a very straight uh, and clear answer whether you agree with it or not. Once you have the government of Europe, once you bring together all these countries in their tremendous strength, well then you can deliberately budget for an agricultural surplus. Say yes, certainly we'll pay a big enough price for farm products to keep a really good and healthy population on the land. And we know perfectly well that it's going to produce a surplus and we are ready and prepared to pay for it and if we spread the burden among a lot of us, it will be nothing at all. But you say, what's the point of that surplus? My friends, that surplus can be one of the winning cards in the whole great business of world politics. Not only can it be the greatest act of charity the world has ever known, and who doesn't want to feed the hungry? Of course we should do what they've talked so long about and never done. Of course we should feed the hungry and the suffering of the world. Let's talk less and let's get on with the doing of it. Let us use the European surplus for that purpose. And in so doing, you've got the greatest card ever played in real politics. Because the use of that surplus in that way will defeat on every market or country of the world the policies of communism. And at the same time, we can keep a healthy agricultural population on our own land, in our own countries, we can feed the hungry of the world, and we can defeat the policies of communism. But how on earth can you begin to do that when you are a dozen little different warring countries, all fighting each other, all afraid of the other, dumping on your market and the rest of it? You must have a great community organized under one government with a definite economic leadership. Why, you can't even run a bazaar. Uh, without some central authority and control. You can't run London, they had to create the LCC. How can you begin to create a real economic policy to solve the problems of Europe and of the world if you have not a central government and a central authority? And I have given you there just one example of how it is possible by such policies in Europe and Asia under the economic leadership of European government to resolve some of the major problems of the day. The only possible way to meet the practical problems confronting us today is to face the fact that we must have European government. And this movement stands alone against all parties for that policy. And that policy in the end, my friends, will come. If you wonder how and when and where it will come, it will come in one way and one way alone. Not through existing governments. Not by the maneuvers of the parliaments and the lobbies and the congresses. It will come under the stress of necessity in the economic crisis which will be inevitable. It will come in a great wave of popular feeling. In a great awakening of the European soul. In a sudden demand to end the nonsense come together and at last to do great things in a great way. That's how it will come. And it's the only possible way uh, in which it can come. You may have observed, my friend, and alas, it is all too characteristic of human affairs, particularly in our age, where forethought is at a discount. You may have observed that nothing really happens until the old show breaks down. 
in Africa, another place in which our policies have been so completely and entirely justified. I won't say triumphantly, because that's not a word to use in a situation of tragedy. But has been completely justified. Nothing could be done. Nobody would listen. Yards of nonsense were turned out. Until the plain truth was proved. This time, alas, very often in blood and in a horror. We stood throughout again in Africa for perfectly clear-cut principles for which we were tremendously abused with every sort of foolish and disgusting lie. It was said we wanted to persecute the blacks, that we were racialists who wanted to put our people on top of one another, of another people. All those disgusting and foolish lies were told about. We said, of course, as I always say, Naturally, we believe in our own race. Any man or woman worth anything believes in his own race as he believes in his own family. But because you believe in your own race or in your own family doesn't mean you want to injure other races or other families. How often have I said a father of a family should know that it's his first duty in nature to look after his own children? But that doesn't mean that he wants to hurt or to injure other children. On the contrary, you will do them any good turn that you can. And our attitude was always the same. Our first duty was to our own people, our British and European peoples. But also, in addition to that, of course, we would do what we could to help other people as well. But we pointed out the lines of policy then being pursued were bound to end in disaster. They talked of what they called multiracialism which was simply a universal mixer. Take humanity, put it in a bag, shake it together, and heaven knows what would come out. They wanted to get rid of what existed. All the little gray people of the world who hate the beautiful colored diversity of human development, they always want to get rid of the natural, the noble and the beautiful. They wanted to get rid of it. They wanted to make all nature as grey as themselves. It was their deep instinct. We were always opposed to that. We said, no, it won't work, and it's undesirable that it should work. We can live in peace and friendship side by side in separate nations and separate developments, but we cannot have the mix-up of peoples and races who are widely different and divergent. It will lead to nothing but trouble. But in pursuit, of their multiracial theory, they not only pursued a mad policy in Africa, the results of which you, you'll be able to see in the Congo, and I'm afraid you'll see before long in other places as well, but in addition to that, they brought a tremendous number of colored people without any reason at all over to this country, without any reason except one. They thought that if they were able to persuade the black people in Africa to accept the whites in multiracial society, they must compel the white people in Britain to accept the blacks here in a multiracial society as well. And that was the beginning and the end of the whole policy. A policy which has broken down and has failed in both Africa and in this country, as has been admitted recently in some of our leading journals and by some of our foremost writers and thinkers. It was bound to fail. We, we foresaw that from the start. And now it is being recognized. After years of disaster, much bloodshed, and quite uh, uh, avoidable uh, horrors in the continent of Africa. Well, the same policy, which we could have had by peace, sense, and decision from the start, is still available to us. It is to divide uh, the white and black populations of Africa, it is to have separate nations living in peace and friendship side by side. Let us do every possible thing to help them, send them technicians and the rest of it, give them all the advice they want in order to develop their own civilization, but not to mix them up with us in conditions which are disastrous to us and fatal to them. Two absolutely clear and distinct policies, and I maintain tonight that the policy for which we've always stood has become entirely justified. 
Now it means that you have to divide Africa between white and black government. Let people travel as they wish within reason in Africa. Black labor is traveling all the time to South Africa where we're told they're so much oppressed because they have there so much higher standard of life. Give people freedom to go and work where they wish on that continent but have perfectly clear-cut demarcations of government. Uh, say that in the well, a part of Africa, I would suggest for discussion, roughly a third uh, south of the Sahara, you would have white government. In the rest, black government. And it is a curious thing that we who are supposed to stand for the oppression uh, of the black population, of the Negro peoples, in fact were the first and the only people to suggest their complete freedom and independence said let them have their freedom, cease to exploit them uh, as colonies, let them set up their own governments, send technicians to help them, and every possible means should be taken to enable them to develop their own civilization. We've said that from the start. And now that's what they want, what they insist on having. All the multiracial business is breaking down because the black peoples are demanding one man, one vote, and are insisting either on the subjection or the expulsion of the white. And we say, all right, in your two-thirds of Africa, which you will have, you can make your own rules and you make your own laws. You won't get on very far or fast if you don't invite white people in to help you. But anyhow, that's your own business. But in the other third, which we say should be ruled by white government, then our law runs. Then our people have their word. And we are not going to surrender the rights of the European in Africa. And we are not going to destroy it. We must have room for expansion. Little Europe will never work. Although many people in the common market and other ventures are not trying to suggest it. We must have great Europe. And great Europe means not only a government of the European peoples, it means the great open spaces into which the Europeans can go and develop their life and develop their genius. And what are those spaces? First I put the British Dominions. Because the British Dominions, when they're invited to enter that great community where they'll find a market in the manner I've described for their foodstuffs and their materials which we have never been able to supply in our small island, of course they'll go in and go in with full-hearted vigor. There, then again, one third of Africa will naturally join up with us, the white Africa I've been discussing. And now, since America, America under its present government, has simply thrown away South America, in South America you will find there are only two forces of the future which will count for anything at all. One is communism, and the other is our new European idea, and it's we who are going to win. There is everywhere. My friends, when we begin to think in the great terms which are worthy of the great European people, don't we begin to see a clear pattern of policy and events? Why should we stay as little countries, muddling ourselves up by mixtures with totally unsuitable people? Instead of these great policies, vast spaces into which our own people go and develop to become, as we'll consider in a moment, far and away the greatest part in the world, with beneficent results not only to ourselves but to all mankind. The alternative, what these people want, this policy of mixture, what does it really mean? It doesn't mean freedom uh, for the black. It doesn't mean brotherhood or any of the Canton humbug which is taught. That is just the mask for some of the vilest forces on earth to exploit the backward peoples in the future as they have done in the past. Every one of us in this hall was old enough to see before the war or educated enough which you all are to read after the war. Every one of you know what happened. How the financial forces in the 30s went into these backward countries 
into India, within the empire, into Hong Kong, into Japan, into China, and exploited these backward peoples to produce cheap, sweaty goods, which ruined the great industries of Britain and of Europe, which put Lancashire out of business in the cotton trade, Yorkshire out of business in the woolen trade. And these poor devils of coolies were exploited for a wage of a few shillings a week. For what purpose? To enable the city of London and Wall Street, New York, to make better profit by sweating the air them and helping us. <laughs> that is why it was done. That was the whole purpose. And with what result? China thrown into the arms of communism. The largest population in the world simply tossed as a present to communism. Because if you treat people like that, it's the only possible result. If there's no one to save them, no one to help them, and they've simply been ground into poverty and sweating and exploitation, what can you expect except they go communist as they did? And India going in the same direction too. One of our own empire countries in the past thrown in that direction and traveling that way. And all these countries which have been exploited, thrown and tossed aside by finance and now becoming the victims of communism. So finance seeks fresh fields of exploitation. Where do they turn? When the old people are exhausted. When many a poor labor has died of consumption and of other horrible diseases in their sweatshops, or when they're exhausted fields of exploitation, where do they turn now? New pastures, new forests, fresh virgin land. Utterly ignorant people, savage people, no trade union protection, absolutely nothing, no one to look after them. And then you erect a Union Jack or another flag of Europe, and under that flag uh, where you allow these things to happen as we have done in the past. And those poor devils that have been sweated and exploited in Africa, like the other poor devils in China, India and Japan. A great new field for sweatshops to be opened up, so that these new industries which we're creating in Britain today will be destroyed as the old industries were. Simplified, rationalized machinery with a few white surveyors and then the masses of cheap colored labor torn off the land and taken into the sweatshops to work and labor and cough their guts out with tuberculosis until they too are thrown on the scrap heap of the sweatshops. Is that worthy of Britain? Is that to be the future of Europe? And is this competition to be organized within our European Brotherhood? bringing in these sweat fields in Africa into our Europe civilization so that the financial power in one European country can use it against the financial power in another. All the great financial central power of the world now shifted from the city of London to Wall Street, New York, shall be able on the mass of money, of wealth and of power which it brings to it again and again to exert its influence in politics until, as you see today, it is childish nonsense to say that a British government rules Britain. It's nothing to do with British government or the British people. The government of the world is the financial government, the power of money and of money alone. And how can you stop it? My friends, by an act of will, an act of the European will, what can you do, we say? Come together, get going, get working, inspire other people like yourselves. If the European peoples decided tomorrow to do it, they could come together, make an European government, they could sort the world out on the lines we've been discussing tonight, we could set up in two-thirds of Africa, in Jamaica and in the other colored countries, their own governments in a great colored federation. We could send the people who've been brought over to our European countries home to good jobs at good wages, and every decent one among them would be glad to go in those conditions. We can solve these problems and sort it out. And within Europe itself, with the economic leadership of government, we can push up wages, salaries, reasonable profit, and the standard of life as science increases the means to produce, free from the undercutting of world competition, free from all the complications of balance of payment problems and the rest of it, 
We can organize in freedom our standard of life, not the controls of socialism or communism, but rather the economic leadership of a government, intervening where it matters to push up wages and the standard of life, to control prices where monopoly exploits. In fact, a government leading within an area containing every raw material, every foodstuff which man can require, and at last free from the fight for world markets and free forever from the domination of world finance. Because what matters? What they do in Wall Street, New York, or any other center where they set themselves up? Their power comes from the present international financial system. Goods have to be moved about the world, services performed, finance supply, and international finance does it. As long as you have the international trading system, this cutthroat system we were discussing earlier, of course finance rules. And any government can be knocked on the head as they have been in Britain, as they were before the war in other countries, again and again. Finance rules and nothing rules but finance. The way to free yourselves is only one way to make your own government in your own country big enough to support a government with a great policy. And that country is Europe. Now you may say, that's all very well, or you may be good enough to think that. But how are we to get there? What are we to do about it? We're just isolated individuals. My friends, nothing has ever been done yet in this world except by the collective action of individuals coming together in faith and belief, in will and resolution, and then making their collective action, building parties and popular movements to do it, building what we call a new model party. And that's what we have to do in the modern world, to make new model parties which will defeat communism and will rouse this will of Europe to do what has to be done. Because it is the will of Europe, the will and the will alone, which is needed in everything. Well, a helpless dependent of foreign power. You ask your government to do this or that. It looks over its shoulder at Wall Street, New York. How can you expect anything else? You're not only dependent on the financial power, you're dependent on the defense of America. Every one of us are occupied countries. Every one of us feels that. Some European countries more acutely than we do. Occupied countries. We can't even defend ourselves. They begin to shiver with terror, these governments, at the thought of the withdrawal of American forces. Why? 300 million Europeans have to cower in fear before 200 million Russians. This European people with the greatest fighting tradition in the world. All the glories of our armies, navies and air forces were to fought each other, but fought each other in demonstrations of heroism without example in the history of the world. And we are told that this people, this people, this European people of 300 million has to shudder in fear before 200 million Russians. Why? Only one possible answer. You're divided. You've got little separate governments in little separate countries. Bring them together and there's no power in the world which you need fear. But yet the very first step in that direction was rejected only recently by our government of Britain. Obviously the first step to win freedom from Europe. And that could be done tomorrow morning. Done before that great force of the people's will which I've previously discussed. To be done with existing governments. If we could change the opinion of Great Britain, it could be done tomorrow morning. Bring together the French and British defense forces which exist today. Develop them together. Develop them with the aid of the science and strength of the whole of Europe, the most advanced continent on earth. And we'll have very, very quickly a force which will render us utterly independent of America and without fear of any kind of Russia. Why not? We in Britain and we in France, if we amalgamated our forces tomorrow, would have a striking force which would prevent any power in the world threatening or attacking us. And if in addition to that we bring the whole strength, uh, science and genius of Europe together with us for further development, 
We British, they're making the greatest contribution and therefore having a very considerable influence because we are five to ten years ahead of any other power in this region. We should then have a force which would render us completely invulnerable to any menace in the world. And yet our government prefers to run away in some visit to the Bahamas and make us absolutely dependent upon American power, turn us into a satellite of the American system. Because our people permits it, and that is why at the present time we are so deeply guilty because we permit these things to be done in our name. We could tomorrow make that European Defence Force which would give us independence, would give us freedom, uh, with Britain being at the head of Europe instead of being uh, a tail uh, on the dog of America. My friends, when I say uh, at the head of Europe, I don't mean one country dominating another. I never meant that, and I've always made it clear. I mean that we should sit at a table, a round table as equals, and the European team contributed from each of the countries, and let our ideas and our character uh, prevail when they're entitled, because they're good ideas or good character to prevail. But let us go there as equals, sitting at that round table, and I've no fear whatever that Britain can play its part and preserve its great identity, its character, and its history. My friends, that is the first step, to put our defenses together. And then after that, it's not only to make ourselves independent, we can make an enormous contribution to the peace of the world and to disarmament and all the things which every sane man desires. Why, when you've got two excitable contestants, two new great powers like America and Russia, bumping against each other on every frontier of the world, what can you expect except continual risk of war? But make the great third force of Europe, bring it between the excitable contestants of today, with all our traditions of calm, of sanity, of political wisdom, with our enormous giant strength, just think of Europe, the dominions, a third of Africa, possibly South America combined in its total strength and power, coming between the contestants of today, calming the whole situation. My friends, we can hold the balance of the globe and win the peace of mankind. Of course we can. Why be afraid to do it? Why sit in our little countries of today, are huddled up in fear, in tradition, in panic about what will happen next? We've only got to go out and do it to resolve in one great act of will. And my friends, it's not only a matter of winning independence, of making a third force in the world, we can make a third system. Because we can bring together the science, the modern science which the genius of the European has created, we can bring it together with three millennia of culture, of art and of the European tradition. And when we brought together modern science and classic wisdom, then at last we've got the balance of the world and some sanity back into the affairs of men. My friends, it's all there. It's all waiting. Of course it can be done. It depends upon ourselves, you see. But again, we're scattered individuals. Everything's against us. Governments, money, press, television, all the new forces are, are used against us. All the great forces, all the material powers of the world, you say, are against you. And so they are. You are quite right to feel that. And I don't underrate them, but I don't despair. And you shouldn't despair, because you, like I, have read something of history. You know something of the record and the achievement of the European. And dark as this hour is, it's no darker, it's not as dark as some of the hours you've known in European history. I read when everything was cowardice, treachery and betrayal. And when the Saracen hordes from far outside Europe swept right across that continent and would have come on over our own Britain too if they hadn't been stopped. And it didn't only happen once, it's happened more than once. Small bands of men came together in resolution, in absolute determination, giving themselves completely and saying Europe shall live and stood firm and faced the menace to Europe, its values, its civilizations, the glory of its achievement, all those things in mortal danger. And they stood firm, they faced it, they came together, and more and more rallied to their standards, 
and those hordes were thrown back again and again and again and Europe lived in triumph because the will of Europe still endured of course but it can happen again we've got other forces against us not those particular forces but the power of money the power of press in some hands all those material forces which governments wield today far more forces of corruption and oppression than have ever been in the hands of government at all but despite all that talk of democracy and our freedom as we well know well in our daily political struggle all those things are against us but if we can bring together with us enough of people like ourselves not only in Britain but as we are doing in other countries of Europe and gradually that force mounts and gathers strength my friends today just as much as in the past we can meet the dark forces which in another way threaten our European life with eternal night we can rally those forces and in the end we can prevail uh, and we can triumph it's been done before and it can be done again our task is to do what we are doing and we began at Venice nearly some 20 months ago as I speak tonight to bring together the best as we saw them uh, the Europeans to get them to take decisions together to decide on the policy which I have described tonight that they would act and do these things together first great step after that the usual trouble the difficulty the struggle to move forward always in human affairs the same story but willpower, endurance, and above all, faith and belief overcomes all. And my friends, let me say to you tonight, that now in the decisions of Britain, which have been bad in recent years, you have the greatest hindrance to the final achievement of Europe. More perhaps in that respect rests upon you, upon all of us, than any other people. Because if tomorrow the British people decided to do these things, the news of that would go like an electric shock of awakening and of hope right through Europe. Nothing matters so much as awakening our own people. Hard as I labor in other lands with other friends and comrades of ours, it comes back to Britain. We must bring Britain with all our knowledge, with our character, with our gifts, with our territories into this immense concern which is going to be Europe and is going to save mankind. My friends, it's an immense responsibility. You're living in a historic hour. Do remember that always. Live in that sense, I beg of you, of history and of destiny. When the period, this period, comes to be written and men look back at it, if we did right, if we stood firm, if we stood greatly, it will be a matter of honor and of veneration for generations to come. I could not ask to live at any other moment of history than this. Because never has mankind, never has the human species been confronted with such possibilities, with such choices of disaster or of greater heights and greater glories. My friends, do live in that sense that you are Englishmen, that you are Europeans, that you come from people who face tremendous odds again and again, that much is against you, but you've got within you that will, that spirit above all, that faith and that belief which will lead the generations to come to look back at you in the pages of history with the proud words to England, to Britain, to Europe, they were true.